Well, aloha, one love. What a the privilege and honor it is to be here. Thank you for letting me come. Uh, we've got to meet the, the Tiptas a few days ago. And, and uh, you know, we, it's amazing when you spend some time with someone, you begin, to want, you begin to really discover things that you have in common. And we had a lot more common than I maybe thought we did. Um, he's been through some stuff, and they've been through some stuff, and so have we. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, and uh, I'm honored to do it, and I want to thank you for coming. I'm delighted that you're here, especially if you're a guest. Uh, we come back when I'm not here. Yeah, they do this every week, right? See? So come back when I'm not here. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. We're glad to see you. Uh, and it shows an interest, you know? It shows an interest in... Um, well, things spiritual, things that happen beyond this. Because I guess, do you notice the death rate here is 100%? Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah we're not getting out of this alive. Uh, unless Jesus, of course, comes back while we are alive, and then we get to skip over that part. But between now and then, you have to be ready for what happens next. So one of the, one of the most prominent things I'm interested in after preaching for 50 years is are you ready for what happens next? And here's the really good news. We're taking reservations tonight. We want to make sure before you leave here, you're ready to go to heaven. I mean, we really do. And so we're going to talk about that. But we're also going to talk about now. You know, what's happening now? And something's always happening now, let's face it. But I don't know about you. I've been around 70 years. But there's more happening now that I've never experienced before in my lifetime and, and I'm not exaggerating. And if you've been around, you know that's true. We're going through a very challenging time, to say the very least. And the last time I was here, I, I really should have looked at the calendar. I didn't. Um, but I would see when I was here last. But when I was here last, there were no vacancies in Ala Moana. I mean, there weren't any. Walk through there now. Go down to the food court. See how many people are out of business. I mean... It's practical. It's happening now. This is real. And it's happening all over the world. I live in Texas and uh, it's happening there. And uh, I'll be in Ohio after I leave here. Yeah, it's happening there. So I want to talk about how to get over that, how to find a new normal, because sometimes things happen to you and you're never going to be the same again. And you can be bitter or you can be better. And so I'm shooting for better. And we're going to talk about that too. So I wrote a book about this. Uh, there it is on the screen. It's called 90 Minutes in Heaven. I wrote it so I would not have to talk about it. <laughs> this has not gone well. Um, and listen, let me say this too. I waited 14 years after I got run over by a truck to write the book. You say, well, I'm, well he must be slow. No, I never planned to talk about this. It, it, it's what I call a sacred secret. It, it's kind of like not describing what you saw. And I didn't plan to do that. Uh, first of all, there are no earthly words to do it justice. There just aren't any. And so I just planned to not talk about this. I was convinced by people a lot smarter and I think more spiritual than I am that I should do it. And so I agreed to write the book and then things changed after that. We have some of the books with us tonight. After we finish here, I, I, I can sign them for you. Um, and if you don't, that's okay too. Um, they're, they're ministry tools for us. We support ministries around the world with my ministry as a result of books and things like that. So um, it's the only way I could really kind of get through this myself personally was to find a reason a lot bigger than what I was already doing to uh, support and help people around the world. Like you saw in Compassion. I'm not doing what they're doing, but I'm trying to do some other things. And it's from book sales and things. Because people wanted to know, and I understand it. Wait a minute, what does he do with all that money that he makes from selling books? 90 Minutes has sold 9 million copies. And uh, gee, I thought they were using for skeet shooting and like, like door stops and things like that. It just didn't turn out that way. Hey, listen, sometimes you try to put something behind you and God puts it in front of you. Have you noticed this? And so that's what I tried to do is put this behind me by writing this book and it didn't work out. I've written some other books too. Uh, they're up there on the screen. We don't have uh, those except the one on the top, 90 Minutes in Heaven, this book, and then the sequel to that book, which is called People I Met at the Gates of Heaven. But I think the most important thing about the title is who's going to be there because of you. You see, I think we're here to help everyone else get there. And I think we have lots of work to do. 
So that's this book, and I'll talk a little bit about this a bit later on. Well, they made a movie about this, and uh, that's pretty creepy. Uh, <laughs> no, it is to have a movie made about your life, and people are saying your words and acting out stuff you did and stuff. In this particular case, the guy who played me is a guy named uh, Hayden Christensen, who started a bunch of movies called Star Wars, and uh, he played Anakin Skywalker. He's getting ready to play him again, incidentally. If you haven't been kind of keeping up what's going on in the media, there's a new series coming out called Obi-Wan Kenobi. I like saying that. Is that Obi-Wan Kenobi? And Anakin Skywalker, and only in the movies can, he's coming back. And he's going to be played by Hayden Christensen. My kids have started calling me Darth Preacher. <laughs> Not sure what that means. So there is a movie. Uh, my wife is played by beautiful actress uh, Kate Bosworth, and there's some other people in the movie that you might know, Michael W. Smith, and um, um, oh, let's see, Dwight Yoakam, and, and uh, Fred Thompson, Senator Fred Thompson from Hunt for Red October and stuff, so it is interesting. I didn't dream my life would be for sale at Walmart, <laughs> and it is. So, a woman walks up to me with a copy of this book. And it is messed up. I mean, it is torn up. It's in pieces practically. And she hands it to me and she said, would you sign my book? I said, yes, ma'am, I'll sign your book. I'm opening it up to start signing her book. And she says, uh, I said, so is this your book? She said, no, it's not my book. I said, okay, whose, whose book is it? She said, it belonged to my daughter. I said, so this is your daughter's book? Yes. And I was about to ask how it got in such awful shape. And she said, um, I didn't know she owned the book. I didn't know she had the book. I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, uh, it was in her backpack. It was in her backpack when she got out of school and she was getting off the school bus and she was run over and killed. I said, your, this book was in your daughter's backpack. Yes. I said, was your, uh, was your, was your daughter a, a follower of Jesus? Oh, yes. Yes, she said. Uh, she was very devoted to the Lord. I said, I'm sorry for your temporary separation from your little girl. It, it's real, but it won't last. And she said, I couldn't bring myself to read your book, really. But I finally opened it up a little bit, and I saw, when I opened it up, my daughter had written things. There's lots of scriptures in the book. She drew circles around them. She drew arrows to certain things. She underlined things in your book. And Mr. Piper, as I read your book, I realized she was telling me things I needed to know. When I got through reading your book, Mr. Piper, I gave my heart to Jesus. And I know where I'm going now. Do you? Are you sure? You can be sure. And that's why we're taking reservations tonight. Let me tell you what happened. I, uh, I did get run over by a truck on the way to church. I think that's important. Not that you're going to get run over on the way home from church. But you know, you could. It can happen any time. You got to be ready all the time because you never know when you could take your last breath here. The Bible says if you're ready, you'll take your next breath somewhere else and a place prepared for prepared people. So that's what happened. I think this next uh, picture is the bridge. That's the bridge. I was going across that bridge in East Texas. It was a Wednesday morning. It was raining. It was cold. Does anybody here know what cold feels like? Anyone? Okay. Well, it was cold and uh, nearly freezing. And uh, oh my goodness, a couple of months ago, it was seven degrees in Houston, Texas. Seven. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Seven degrees. But it wasn't that cold then. So I'm driving across this bridge and I am on my way to church. I just finished a pastor's conference and I'm going home. It's Wednesday. I have a Wednesday night service to be a part of in our church. So I, I get in the car, I'm driving across this bridge, I'm going, and here's the deal, I was going a different way than I planned to go. I'm, I'm a curious person by nature, I decided to go home a different way, I'd never been this way before. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. You heard they had a dead guy down the church, you wanted to go see him, so you came to church out of curiosity. Let me say this, 
Going to church out of curiosity is a great idea because you'll get answers to your questions here every week. Well, I'm driving across the bridge out of curiosity. I didn't make it off the bridge. At the opposite end of the bridge is a steep embankment going down. Does this bridge look like it belongs in Hawaii? I think it does. This metal superstructure over the top of it. I'm almost off and an 18 wheeler is coming the opposite direction at a high rate of speed, speeding. He set a car pull down in front of him at the last minute and he decided to avoid that car. What he did, he pulled over into my lane. Now, in fairness, he couldn't see oncoming traffic because the bridge is in the way, the superstructure. So he swerved over into my lane and ran over me. I mean, ran over me, literally. The truck went off the front, went off the back, swerved back over into his lane and, and, and hit two more cars. So it's a four car pileup on this bridge, which incidentally is called the Trinity River Bridge. So I'm killed instantly. Which I think brings up an interesting question. What am I doing in Honolulu? I want to ask you the same question. What are you doing here that matters? What about it? We'll come back to that, I promise. Eventually, four paramedics arrived on the scene. Four ambulances, there were four cars. Amazingly, no one else was injured in the accident, shaken up, not injured. They were treated and released, which meant that, very unusually, Four paramedics are working on the same victim and they're trying to resuscitate me. They're trying to bring me back. They're trying to do everything they can to revive me. I mean, they tried everything. I've talked to some of them since and they were unsuccessful. So I was pronounced dead on the scene. The body is covered up with a waterproof tarp because it was raining, remember? All the windows are gone. The roof is peeled back. Uh, I'm in terrible shape. You wouldn't have wanted to see it. So they're waiting now for a coroner. That's the actual car. You can see the, the, the tra trajectory over the front left fender, you know, that's where they become. So he came right up over there and crushed the, the car with me in it. That's the side view. This is before airbags, so the steering wheel just went right into my chest. My head went against the side of the car. I had brain damage. I want you to meet my wife that's outside at the book table. She believes I still have brain damage. And <laughs> no, this works out well sometimes, I promise you. <laughs> It does. So I did, and uh, you don't want to know the symptoms that I had with the blood coming. And, it, and so the dashboard of the car collapsed on my legs when the truck went up over the hood of the car. My right leg was broken at the knee, just broken. My left leg was severed above the left knee about an inch because I'd slid in the seat a little bit. It cut my left leg in two. Four inches of femur, the largest bone in the human body, was ejected from that car over the railing of the bridge and never found. So I put my arm up. Waxer was asking earlier about that and I must have seen the car out of the corner of my eyes, I guess, because they didn't put my arm up because it happened in such a split, split, split second. And the, and the truck took my arm into the back seat of the car, separated at the shoulder, and from here forward was lying on the back seat of the car. So it's the coroner, they're waiting. And apparently there were other accidents in the county that day, so everything's just at a standstill on the bridge. It's blocked, there's four wrecked vehicles, uh, people are just not going anywhere. Behind me are lots of the other preachers who had been at the conference with me. I met some of them. I didn't meet some of them. Well, I was about to meet another one. He leaves his car, walks up to the bridge. His name was Dick on a wrecker. He sees this carnage everywhere. And he says to the policeman in charge, who's become a good friend of mine, a state trooper, retired. He says to him, um, I'm a pastor in Houston. I would like to pray for the victims. And the policeman said, that's very nice, but there's no one to pray for. Everyone else is okay. The man in the red car is dead. He's a fatality. He didn't make it. And when the policeman said that, God spoke to the preacher. I think I want a preacher God speaks to. I mean, I want to be a, speaker, a preacher that God speaks to. So here's what God said. And incidentally, God is doing a lot more speaking than we are listening. So he's speaking and here's what he says. Pray for the man in the red car. Though I didn't make any sense to him. That wasn't part of his theology. Praying for dead people. Probably not part of your theology. 
Certain one, certainly wasn't part of mine before I got run over by a truck. In fact, I wouldn't even believe this story if it hadn't happened to me. <laughs> so, he gets permission to get in the car. He can't get in the front of the car. That door has been broken open later. And this is at the wrecking yard. So he crawls in the back of the hatchback of the, can we go to the previous slide? You can see the hatchback would have been back there in the back. He crawls into that area. He goes under the tarp that the body's covered up with. And he looks at me and discovers the only thing I didn't break was my right arm. So he reaches from behind. He puts his hand on my right arm. And he starts praying for me because God told him to. And he's not the only one praying by this time because they did search me to try to find my identity. When they did, they called my church. Well, I mean, I had a business card in my wallet from my church. So they called the church and they told them I had been in a terrible accident, but they didn't tell them I was dead because they try not to do that on the phone. I mean, you try to do that in person. So the church knows I've been in a bad accident, but not the time of fatality. They go and get my wife. My wife is teaching school. And so she was, they didn't know. I mean, the authorities on the bridge would not have known where she was. So they, they went and got her. They collected our children and took them somewhere. And so it's all becoming back, you know, it's all, they're all coming together in Houston. But they don't know anybody down there that I'm a fatality. On the bridge they know because they're waiting for the coroner. And one man is under the wreckage, uh, in the wreckage of the car, covered up with a waterproof tarp, holding onto my shoulders, singing, hymns. Now this goes on for an hour and a half because the coroner apparently can't get there. They can't move the body until they do an investigation. It's just a standstill. It's a big mess. So uh, they're, they're trying to wait for him. Dick on a record spraying under the car. But now he's been to alt, he's begun to alternate verbal prayers with musical prayers. You know what musical prayers are? We just did some right up here. He's singing an old one though. He's singing one called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. This is a great old tune. He's singing it, holding onto my right shoulder of my dead body. 90 minutes after the truck hit me and killed me. People are praying all over the world. They don't know I'm dead. They're just praying for the preacher who had a wreck on the way to church. I've met people since that day all over the world who prayed for me that day without even knowing who I was. I always tell them, keep praying, it works, because they prayed, and I'm here. So Dick on on a record spraying, and he's singing, wonderful when we have a Jesus, suddenly without any warning, under the tarp, in the dark, as he's holding onto my right shoulder, I start singing the song with him. He gets out of the car really fast. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Yeah. Some of you probably faster than others, but he went over to the policeman, the same policeman that he's pleaded with to let him get in the car and he says to the officer, officer, the dead man is singing and nobody, nobody believed that. I can understand that. I, I actually remember singing with him even though I didn't know who he was. He was really making me sing continuously to keep me conscious so I wouldn't lapse back in, you know. So I'm singing and, and he really had to do some serious stuff to try to get me out of the car because they weren't listening to him. They, they thought he was imagining it. They thought it was a hallucination or something or just maybe wishful thinking. Finally, he convinced them to do it by basically saying, if you don't, lie, if you don't go check on him, I'm going to lie on the bridge in front of the ambulance and you're going to have to run over me. So they did. And they found out I was alive. Not very, but alive. So they eventually extricated me from that car. I was taken to a series of hospitals. After the accident happened at 11.45 in the morning, I arrived at a level one trauma center in Houston, Texas at 6.15 that night, six and a half hours after the wreck. I probably died several more times. I know I did later. And I would be in a hospital bed from that day forward for 13 months. And I would have 34 operations to put me back together again. So here's a couple of things that I want to mention before we move on to finding a new normal. Number one, I believe that God answers prayer. I think we have not because we ask not. These people were praying that I would live. I had nothing to do with my survival. If I'd have had a choice, I would have told them to stop praying because I was having the best time. And you will see in a moment what I came back to. But they were praying and God said yes. Look at this verse from... Uh, from John uh, chapter 14. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Do you, you take that seriously? Is that, is that literal to you? You may ask me for anything in my name. 
Well, Dick Honorecker was asking for a dead man to live. And not only that, he was asking for me to be free from brain damage. He was asking me to be free from internal injuries that would have compromised my life anyway had I lived. He was asking me to have a meaningful life. That's what he was asking for. And I walked in here tonight on my own two legs. This is the arm that was in the back seat. So God does answer prayer. Is the answer always yes? No. No, I, I can tell you this. I'm glad God didn't answer some of my prayers yes. If I'd have got one to ask for, it would have been a disaster. I mean, effective praying starts with praying for what to pray for. To knowing the will of God. Because that's what in Jesus' name means. That's what it means. In my name. And it doesn't mean you can just tack that on the end of a prayer and get anything you want. It's not name it and claim it. It is praying in the name of Jesus for the things that God wants you to have. He says, I will do it. I'm standing here tonight because he did it. I believe in answered prayer. I could testify all night long about answered prayer and the people I've seen and experience as a result of that. But you know, I think God is still in the miracle business too. Have you noticed this? There's simply things that happen for which there's no earthly explanation. Look at this verse. It's also in John chapter 14, which I will reference in the end, because this is the chapter that begins with, let not your hearts be troubled. We want to go there. I tell you the truth, and anyone, remember what the other verse said, that you can ask me for anything. Look at, look at who this is addressed to. Anyone who has faith in me. Well, I hope, yeah, there's some in this room that has faith in him. Anyone who has faith in me, will do what I've been doing. This is Jesus talking. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Now think about it. This is right before he gets arrested and executed. And he's trying to prepare them for what happens next. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing and will do even greater things than these. I think God's doing some of his best stuff now. I do. I mean, I think of some of the people that I've encountered in these past 30 years in particular, but even before that, who were at death's door. I think of the people who were in, so distressed and so beaten up and beaten down that there was just no way they were going to recover from it. And so many of those not only are living and prospering and doing well, it's just a miracle. Everybody who, who, who were not believers, people who didn't believe would claim, they would testify that this person experienced a miracle. I think God's doing some of his best stuff now. I mean, he's talking to some people who saw him. This is Jesus at, at what we now call the Last Supper. He's talking to me. He says, any one of you. Now listen to this. He's talking to some guys who saw him change water into wine. They saw him give sight to the blind. They were standing, at least some of them were outside the tomb when he said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes walking out of the tomb. And he's telling them now that you're going to do greater things than these after I'm gone. I think God's doing some of his best stuff now. And I, I believe this. If you live long enough, you're going to need a miracle. Maybe several of them. I have good news for you. God is still in the miracle business. Amen. I know. I am one. I certainly don't look very miraculous, but it's a, it's a miracle that I'm here. I mean, I got run over by an 18-wheeler and was pronounced dead by four paramedics. And I'm walking out of here when I'm finished. So I, I believe in miracles. So what about the horrible, terrible, tragic, painful, difficult experiences of this life? What about those? How do you deal with those? How do you deal with all the unemployed people who used to have a job but didn't? I picked up a, a, a rental car. Try that. A rental car. It's, you know... It's a good thing my kids are so old that nobody will give me any money for them. Uh, I think I would have had to give them a kid to get the rental car. It was... <laughs> so I talked to the guy while we were waiting, and he was talking about all the people they laid off in the early days of COVID and all the cars they sold in the early days of COVID. And one of the reasons that anybody who wants to get a rental car now is going to probably have to knock over a couple of 7-Elevens to get enough money to do it. So... What about all those people who got laid off? What about all those people who had funerals? I mean, if they could even have a funeral for somebody who died. I mean, maybe they're watching it. How about all those people who sat at home and had a nurse hold a microphone up to somebody who's saying their last words to their family because nobody could go and see them? 
How about those people? How about the lonely people who can't go out because everybody was, they, they were contagious. And so they sat at home kind of behind closed doors and they were so lonely, they don't even have words for how lonely they were. Now, there's still people like that without a COVID. But I mean, think about it. You know, I, I could go on and explain this about how difficult life can be, how painful life can be. Well, let's scroll through maybe one of the hospital pictures uh, of where I'm actually in the hospital bed. I'm sorry, I should apologize for that picture before it came up. I, I didn't know that was the next one. I, I lost my leg. Uh, I developed pneumonia in both lungs, which meant that I couldn't be elevated because I had two broken legs and a broken arm to, to get breathing treatments. If you can't get breathing treatments when you have pneumonia, you're not going to make it. And so they couldn't lift me. They bring in my wife, who, 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 if you haven't guessed yet, is the hero of this story. I am not. I survived this. She overcame this. That's my wife. And she's told in five minutes, we're either going to cut what's left of your husband's leg off, or we're going to try an experimental treatment that's never been done before. It's invented by a Russian doctor named Elizarov, and it means we're going to break your husband's leg in another place, and we're going to put halos of steel from his pelvis all the way down past his knee, and then we're going to turn screws on these halos four times a day and try to stretch the remaining pieces of bone to close the gap where the bones are missing. Sound good? I had 30 open wounds in my leg that they had to pour hydrogen peroxide down every day. Hopefully they wouldn't be infected, but they did get infected. I found myself behind, you know, like those rooms, uh, sterile rooms uh, when astronauts are doing things so they can't take germs. I mean, I'm behind a window. I'm like in a zoo and people are looking at me and they had to get fully dressed from head to toe to come in. So it was, it was just a nightmare experience, I must say. And I'm wearing that on my, on my arm. Can we go, now we can go back to the profile picture now that, now that everybody knows how gross this is. You can also see where they took the skin off my leg. My arm was missing everything. I mean, it's just not connected. So all the bones in this arm came from my right pelvis. They took bones out of my hip and put them in here. All the muscles and skin came from other places. All the skin actually came from my right leg. So, they, you know, med medical people have a wonderful knack for finding things you didn't even hurt and hurt those for you to fix the other stuff. So I wore that thing with rods going through my arm and out the other side, a bar of steel above it and below it, and then that contraption there on my leg. Uh, I wore that for 11 months. I wore this for, for eight months. And if you, now you can go back to the other picture. You can see uh, where they took skin off my leg and they put it over here. And it's just, it was just a nightmare really. And no one could give me any answers. Experimental treatment? We don't know. I mean, we've never tried this before and we're hoping that it will turn out. But to be honest with you, you could wear this thing for a year and then you could lose your leg. Go, go through this and then lose your leg. It's very possible because we don't know the outcome. We don't know the results. So I descended into a great depression. Do people, do preachers get depressed? You bet they do. I mean, I didn't want to be here. I hadn't told anybody about heaven at all when this was going on. I never really planned to. My wife didn't know. My friends didn't know. And I am so depressed about coming back from there to here and looking and feeling like this. I just can't exaggerate it, honestly. I hit the bottom. There's only two good things that can happen when you hit the bottom. Or one good thing, really. Push off when you hit the bottom. I, I hit the bottom. So I'm laying there in this same hospital room for weeks and months, and it's just, it's just a, a, a hellish existence, frankly. Um, there was no one I could talk to who understood because no one else was going through this. And so one morning at 3 a.m., I found myself after a lot of shots that tried to put me to sleep, none of which worked. I'm laying there in that same bed. Room 21, 2315 on 21st floor, St. Luke's Medical Tower in Houston. And I'm doing this. If you're not looking, you have to look up for this. Why? Why? Why did you bring me back for this? And why can't you send somebody, anybody here that helps me understand 
what this is going to be like. Even if it's bad news, even if it's difficult news, if I just know where this is going, I feel like I can live and make it for another day. Why can't you send somebody here who gets it? One of those rare times in life, only two I can think of, when I heard the voice of God speak to me. And here's what he said. This is not about you. It's about me. And what I can do through you now, I can never do before the truck ran over you, son. You need to get over your pity party. And you need to turn your mess into a message. You need to turn your pain into a purpose. You need to take your test and turn it into a testimony that's going to bless other people. And then you'll understand why you went through this. I started crying. I wasn't very given to that up until that point in my life. That's three o'clock in the morning. I cried until the sun came up. And I know the sun came up because I was on the 21st floor and the blinds were open. It came streaming into my room. And so I knew then that all the stuff that had happened to me, and it, it was pretty dramatic, frankly, uh, it, the only way I was going to get past it was stop looking at my, per, uh, my personal condition, the things I was enduring, and take the same hand that I was shaking at God. Incidentally, he'd rather you be angry at him than ignore him. He's God. He can handle it. So maybe anger is the way you start because you're talking to God. And so I'm not angry, I'm frustrated. I'm saying, why can't you send somebody who understands what I'm going through? I, I got to tell you, when the sun came up the next day, it was the beginning of the rest of my life. I, I began to start looking for opportunities to bless anybody. And, and, and they took them. I mean, they wanted to talk to a guy who'd been at the bottom. I mean a bottom. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't know, you know somebody who does. So what are you doing to help them? What are you doing to minister to them? Well, I had all kinds of people do stuff for me that no one should ever have to do for another human being. That'll humble you. And it humbled me. But I kept looking for people to bless. I, I, I would speak. People read the book. And in the early days, I would stand up like this and four or five rows of people were sitting over here with these devices on. They read the book. They wanted to hug somebody who understood what they were going through. Listen, you've lost your husband. You lost your wife. You lost your business. Fill in the blank. So you can either do this. Why did this happen to me? Or you can do this. Let me help you. I understand how you feel. And together... We can get through this. Hey, that's a word for some of you. That's a word for Hawaii. Because it's, it's been tough. I mean, anybody who says it hasn't been doesn't really know what they're talking about. So we can either hit the bottom. We can wallow in self-pity, which is what I did. Because I couldn't find anybody who understood. How about being somebody who understands? Now, could we use that here or not? I think we can. And I want to suggest to you that maybe tonight you go over to one of the prayer uh, panels over here and you just get down on your knees and help, ask God to help you help others help him. Can you do that? I think you can. God's speaking to you. You can do that. God help you. There's one other verse I want to show you in 2 Corinthians about the basis for taking our tragedies. And here it is, very familiar to many, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Now listen to this. Based on what I just got through saying, listen to this. Praise be to God the Father, or, or God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this, the Father of compassion. Compassion. I mean, we saw a thing here earlier, of an organization called Compassion International. that's doing incredible stuff around the world. We may not be able to go where they are, but we can help them go. Compassion. And the God of all, here's the word, comfort. Comfort. Listen to this. Who comforts us in all our troubles, all our troubles, so that we can comfort others. Those in trouble. With, with the same comfort that God has given to us. Now, I, I just want to challenge you. I mean, I asked you earlier, what are you doing in Honolulu? What are you doing in Oahu? What are you doing in Hawaii? 
maybe what we ought to be doing is looking around for opportunities to bless other people who are going through a long, dark night, who are shaking their fist at God and saying, I don't understand. I was doing my best. I was trying so hard. And then suddenly the rug got pulled out from under me. I'm on the bottom. I don't think I can go on another day. I'll help you. We'll get through this together. They want somebody who gets it. When the big truck hit me, I was standing at the gates of heaven. I didn't go in a long tunnel. There wasn't a bright light at the end of the tunnel. I didn't have a near-death experience. When you're dead an hour and a half, you're not nearly dead. It was just like that. I do that because I can. Yeah. I just thought of that, you know. I, just do, I do this. Why do I do that? I do it because I can. Now, I say this. This is a screen grab from the movie. This is one of the few times I was not on the set of the movie while it was being made so that it would be accurate. And there were some wonderful people there who are called costume people. And they took it upon themselves to select these costumes for these people when people in heaven don't wear costumes. They don't even wear street clothes or anything like that. So I saw the rushes of this after it was over with. The people are real. Everything else is computer generated. And I said, we, we have to do this over again. You can't show this. People are going to, well, they couldn't do it over again. So people in heaven do not wear street clothes. They don't wear the clothes. You don't go to your closet in the morning and say, okay, what am I going to thrill the throngs with today? It's not going to happen. Everybody wears the same thing in heaven. The playing field is level and they're magnificent robes. I think you'll like them a lot. I, I was standing at the gates of heaven. If you read Revelation 21, you'll see that there are 12 of these gates, 12 gates in heaven. Now, let me start with reading the preface to Revelation 21. Very familiar to many people. It's often read at funerals for very good reason. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. When the Bible talks about not being any sea, it's essentially saying in heaven, we are not separated by anything. I guess you've noticed this, getting in a kayak and rowing towards the mainland is probably not gonna work. You know, because it's a long way. We're separated by one of the longest, if not the longest stretches of water in the world in terms of how isolated things can be. So in heaven, there is no sea. Nothing separates us. We're all together all the time. That's great. You're, you'll, have, you'll love it. So it says uh, that the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city. Now note this. We don't have time to get into it tonight. But every time the Bible talks about heaven, it does it in concrete terms. Heaven is a real place. Whether it's, it's, a, it's a city. It's a place, Jesus called it. It's, it's more real than this. I mean, this is a nice place, but one of these days this won't be here and neither will you. Heaven is real and it's forever and it's a place. So here it is, the holy city, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. That is so overlooked in most people's reading of scripture. My wife and I have been married 47 years. She doesn't look at, I do. I remember the night like it was yesterday. I'm standing down here at the foot of the aisle, she's coming down the arm of her father. Now, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but in weddings, when the broom, groom walks in with his little entourage, people lean over and say, is that him? <laughs> Am I right? What happens when the bride walks in? People stand up, the air is sucked out of the room, they're facing her direction, and it's just an enormous celebration. She's in the room. But now nobody is looking at her like him. This is his bride. This is a great gift from God. And she is. Mine is. And so he's looking at her with great anticipation about the life that they're going to live together and the three kids that we've had and the six grandchildren that we've had. That's what he's excited about. And I was excited, but you know what? I don't think people look at heaven like this at all. Like looking at the, because the bride. We don't look at it that way. What what if we did? What if we lived in such excitement and anticipation of heaven, we tried to get other people in all the time? Yeah. What if we did? So let me challenge you tonight with that verse, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Heaven, 
Are you going? Who's going to be there because of you? Now listen to this. This this is really getting really getting hardcore here. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God. Now this is the first of three withs. W-I-T-H. First the three withs. And I heard a, 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 a voice from the throne. God is with man. And he will live with them. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. Anytime the Bible says with Anything else for that matter, three times, pay attention to this. So, you want to know the best thing about heaven? You're with God. I mean, you're with God. You're not hoping God will show up. You hope you're not praying God down. You're not, I mean, you are with God. This is his place. And you are there. You're there forever. Yeah. So, it's with God. But now there's some practical aspects to this too. Listen, there will, this, there will be his people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, I mean, no doubt, you've had tears in yours. I know I have in mine. I mean, I was watching, re-watching the, the funeral of Prince Philip. I, my name is Piper. I'm mostly Scottish. The bagpipes get to me like, like nothing I can describe. And so when they started playing that bagpipes as they were lowering his body into the thing, I'm, I'm crying. It just does. Hey, in heaven there are no tears. No one cries. No one has to. There's nothing to be sad about. Well, he wiped away the tears. There will be no more death. Can I get a witness here? No more death. I'm tired of death. I'm tired of funerals. I'm tired of looking at the scoreboard every day and seeing that 566,000 Americans died. If that's accurate, maybe a lot more than that. Just short of three million people. There's no more death in heaven. No one dies. Or mourning. You know, there doesn't have to be mourning if there's no death. And here's my favorite. Or pain. No pain. Preacher, no pain in heaven. Now, you know if we went up and down the aisles here and talked to each person. And he said, let's just be honest. What, What kind of pain are you enduring right now? It would be varying in degrees, but you know, part of this existence here is pain. Jesus, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he died. Pain. There's no pain in heaven. No pain. No one dies. There's more, no mourning, no cries. For the old order of things has passed away. Aren't you ready? For the old order of things to pass away. Heaven's a whole new thing. And the reason I know this is because this is what Jesus said to those same guys in the upper room right before he dies. You go to Jerusalem, the upper room, or what they believe to be the upper room, is right above David's tomb. I mean, you go to David's tomb down here, the men go in one entrance, the women go in the other, and, and, and you, you see David's tomb where King David's buried. Right above that, or just in the room off to the side of it, is what they believe to be the room where the Last Supper took place. Now, Jesus is in that room, and he's trying to console his followers. He's trying to prepare them for what happens next, because something is going to happen next, and it's been happening ever since. And he says this to them, because he's looking at their faces like I'm looking at yours. He could see they're in pain. They're afraid. They're scared, because their lives are on the line, too. Let's face it, all except one of them, as far as we know, died a horrible death. And he says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe in me. Also, in my Father's house, concrete word, house, or many mansions, or rooms, concrete. And I go to prepare a what? A place for you. It's a place. I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you will also be. Well, didn't Revelation just say you'll be with God? We'll be together forever, he says. And you know where I'm going. Now, remember who he's talking to here. He's talking to guys that follow him around three and a half years. He, they, they, they heard him say where he was going to go and how this was going to turn out. But it's kind of like being in church. They weren't listening. <laughs> I'm seeing if you were. She, and we know this is true because Thomas, of course, stands up and says, 
We, we don't know where you're going. And we don't know how to get there. And maybe that's your question. I mean, somebody invited you tonight. And it's this guy going to talk about heaven tonight. And, uh, well, you may or may not believe in heaven. Or you certainly may or may not believe you're going there. And Thomas adds the question that's on the hearts of most everybody else. And here it is. How do I get to heaven? Is it real? How do I get to heaven? And Jesus responds. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Now I notice in this church there's several aisles. You know, a lot of people on earth think that many paths lead to heaven. You can try this and they'll take you to heaven. You can be good. Your mother can be a Methodist. You can, you can go down a whole list of things they think will get you into heaven. And what did Jesus say? No man comes to the Father except through me. If you're going to try something else, it's not going to work. Jesus is the way. If you're looking for the way, he is the way. If you're looking for truth, he is the truth. If you're looking for a better life than the one you're living right now, Jesus is the life. I found out on a lonely highway in East Texas what an 18-wheeler. I believed it. I just wasn't preparing to die that day. Are you? Hey, this is urgent. I'm not just saying this. I mean, the truth is you've got to be ready all the time. Don't leave here without being ready. Well, I'm going in now. And I'm walking past these people. I was greeted at the gates of heaven by people who helped me get there. Well, what does that mean? My grandfather was the first person I saw. I was with him when he died. We were very close. My dad was career army. He fought in World War II, Vietnam, and Korea. All three. My dad never left, or my father, grandfather never left. His name was Joe. And so Joe was always there for us. He was illiterate. He could not read or write, but he was a carpenter. He could take lumbers and nails and build stuff like this. I thought he was a genius. I mean, 70 years later, some of his stuff that he built is still standing after he's gone. So I adored him. And so when the truck struck me and I'm standing at the gates, one of the 12 gates of heaven, I'm looking at him. And I knew where he was. He was waiting on me. Now, let me say this. You're not going to sneak up on heaven. Everybody up there knows who's coming. The Bible's very clear. When you give your heart to Jesus, it's inscribed in a book up there, like a registration book, kind of like in a hotel, but much better. And they know you're coming up there. They celebrate your decision. Why don't we give them something to celebrate tonight? You know, you came to church to hear this, but I mean, the truth is, if you were to die, you, you're not sure you're going to heaven. And you can leave here, sure. And may you live for decades. So, there we were. Joe was there. He reached out his hands to me and spoke a language I've never heard before, but fully understood and said, welcome home, Donnie. That's what he called me here. No one else did. When I saw his face, I knew where I was. My grandfather was missing three fingers on one hand and two on the other. All that hard labor. But when I looked down at the hands, all of his fingers were there. I'd never seen them before. Hey, look, you look good tonight, but you're going to look great in heaven. I mean, you'll be the way that God wanted you to be when he created you in the first place, before earth took its toll on you because of all the the scars that you have. I mean, I look like I fell in a farm implement from the neck down. Not in heaven. There is one person in heaven with scars, and that's Jesus Christ. To remind the rest of us of how we got there. It's been said the only man-made thing in heaven are the scars of Jesus Christ. You won't have any on you. They all look good. My great-grandmother was standing right beside him. She was a victim of osteoporosis on earth. She walked like this. She couldn't stand up straight. I'm headed there myself. But you know what? In heaven, she was a good six inches taller because she was standing up straight. She wasn't missing her fingers like my grandfather. She was missing her teeth. When I saw her in heaven, she smiled at me. It was the most beautiful smile I have ever seen in all of my existence. It was a real smile, not a fake one, not a false one, a real one. There were teachers there, there were aunts and uncles, there were people that I had known and loved in life and they all looked magnificent. They knew I was coming. One of the things that really struck me 
is, is, is the sentence I put at the, at the end of this last book. The people who helped me get to heaven were the people who greeted me in heaven. Where was everybody else? They were inside. They did not come outside. I knew I would see them inside. But these people gave me a Bible when I didn't have one. They took me to church when nobody else would and I didn't have another way to go. They told me about Jesus verbally. They lived a Christian life in front of me so I knew what one was. And they were there. They deserved to be there. They were waiting for me because they helped me get there. And I lay there in the hospital bed for months. And I would think about their faces. Real, this is before I told anybody what had happened to me. You know, I came up with that question because it's the question that drives me today. Who's going to be in heaven because of you? I ask you to start here. What are you doing in Honolulu? Well, let me suggest what you should be doing is helping everyone else get to heaven. In Hawaii, we have much work to do. We do. God help you. Help others know him. Over their faces I could see inside, there's a golden boulevard running down the street. Revelation 22, you'll read, or 21, that you'll see that there are, there's a golden street. It does say street, street in heaven. At the end of that, pinnacle is lifted up high. I saw the brightest light there. And let me say this, in heaven you'll be blinded by the light of heaven, but you won't have earthly eyes, so you won't be blinded. And I'm looking at that light, and I know that's where the Lord is high and lifted up. I, as much as I enjoyed reunion with these people, I knew they would live with me inside. I wanted to go through the gate. And incidentally, the wall of heaven is pretty thick by our standards. The gate is not big. It is made of pearl. It's a pearl gate. A gate made of pearl. Something we ought to know about here in Hawaii. You can't go into the mall without being stopped to look at some pearls. And so you're going to like the pearls in heaven. It's a pearly gate. Truly, that's not an exaggeration. So I wanted to go past the pearly gate, through the thick walls, all the jasper everywhere, and I wanted to go down the boulevard, climb that pinnacle, and fall at the feet of great God of all creation and say, thank you for letting me come. Thank you. But I never got a chance. I did pass the people. I did approach the gate. I'm, I'm uh, surrounded by angels. They're everywhere. There's the ones who bear us up. Uh, to heaven, and I could hear their voices, but the thing that really blew me away were their wings. I could hear the wings of angels. Incidentally, we don't have time to get into it, but you don't become an angel in heaven. That's a completely different group of beings. We're highly favored. Jesus died for us. So the angels are everywhere, but I, and I heard their voices and I heard their wings, and I was greatly comforted by that. But then I heard the music. If you like music, you're really going to have a good time in heaven because they got great music up there. And here's the thing that just, just, I don't even have, I can't describe it. There were thousands of songs at the same time without chaos. I could distinguish each one of the songs with my heavenly ears. Except one that soared above them. Pastors already referenced it. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 because he is holy and we're not. Which brings up a question that I will close with. If I'm not holy, how did I get into heaven? Great question. Maybe yours, like, well, if God knew what I did, he would. No, no, he knows what you did. Can you go anyway? Yes, absolutely you can. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. Well, I wasn't only, but on a morning like tomorrow, let's say. Uh, they were having a service and the pastor was standing here and he said, at the end of the service, like I'm saying to you, who wants to go to heaven? We're taking reservations today. I was 16 years old, I was sitting on the third row and I had been going to church. I had been reading my Bible. Remember somebody else had to take me to church before I got a driver's license. And I was, I was under serious conviction. I mean, I knew I needed Jesus. And when he said, who wants to go to heaven? We're taking risks. I, I was up out of my seat. I was down at the front. I shook his hands and said, I want to go to heaven. And he said, son, this is the best decision you'll ever make. And he was right. I didn't know that in a lonely highway in East Texas, 22 years later, I would be run over by an 18-wheeler. Thank God I was ready. So that made me holy in the sight of God. My sins were forgiven. Jesus paid the price so that I could get in, so I could enter into God's presence. And that's what he'll do for you.
And he's willing to do it right now if you're willing to do it right now. So I'm going in. And I'm so ecstatic. I, I, like I said, I have no words. And as I'm approaching the inside, the choir is singing. You know what? I could even smell the, the prayers of the saints coming from the throne of God. Heaven is a sensory explosion. It's, it's a buffet for the senses. It's the most amazing thing I've ever been a part of. Well, I'm going in and suddenly it all stopped. I mean, it stopped. I found myself in silence and darkness and I, I tried to make my voice cry out, what's going on? I just got here. But I, I couldn't verbalize anything. And then I heard a voice, one voice out of the darkness, not in front of me like heaven was, behind me, in the darkness, a voice I did not know saying, what a friend we have in Jesus. And I was back here, in the dark, in a car with a obliterated body. Now I didn't know what I had in store for me. So I lay like this, if you can go back to that long picture of in the bed, that one. So I lay in a hospital bed like that for many months. And I asked the same question every day that you would ask. Why did you let me see that and take it away from me? I have an answer tonight. So I could be at one love and tell you to your face, heaven is real. And Jesus is the way. So right now, we're going to give you an opportunity to make that decision. Because we love you here and we want to love you there. Has there ever been a time in your life when you trusted the Lord for your salvation? Trusted the Lord to bring you to the gates of heaven and inside. Eternally. No night there. Always brilliant and bright. Jesus actually gets another name. He's called the Lamp of God. Lamp of God. You can read it in Revelation 21. Not, not lamb, he is the lamb, but the lamp of God in heaven. You'll bask in his brilliance in heaven. So we're taking reservations tonight. Here's the deal. Maybe you're here, you've been through a long dark night, you're, you, you've lost your business or you've lost somebody that you love. Somebody would be willing to pray with you tonight. Well, we, we, we've got these prayer rails over here and, and somebody will pray with you. Maybe you're just, you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you just don't think you can go on. You can. And not only that, you can help other people get through it. Because you get it. And they need to talk to somebody who can. Or maybe if the truth be told, you're not ready for heaven. It's been said that if you're not ready for heaven, you're not ready for earth. So you need to take care of that tonight. Would you do that? In a moment, praise team is going to come. We're going to pray for you. So I'm just going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Would you? No looking around. Are you sure you're going to heaven? Are you sure? If you're not sure and you would like me to pray for you, I'm not going to come to where you are. I'm not going to identify you in any way. But by lifting your hand, you're saying, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven, but I would like to be sure. Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you just quietly lift up your hand right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure, but I want to be sure. I want to be ready for heaven. Praise God. Many hands. I appreciate your honesty and God sees it. Thank you. God bless you. If you lifted up your hand, and even if you didn't, I mean, if, even if you just couldn't quite bring yourself to that and you're still not sure, just, just, just pray with me, would you? Lord, I thank you for these uh, honest hands and these honest people. And I'm praying, Lord, that tonight, tonight, really, definitely, in their heart of hearts, they will understand that the only way to heaven is Jesus. And that he will take them there. He will meet them there. And he will be with them forever by accepting what he has already done. And that's died on the cross for our sins. If that's you and you want to go to heaven... Just pray with me. You could pray silently where you are. You could pray out loud. But just pray with me. And you can use your own words. You don't have to repeat mine. Dear Lord, I am sorry for my sins. 
but I'm not just sorry, I want to change. I want to live for you. I want to be the person that you want me to be. So come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, put me on a new path, shine the light on it so I'll be sure to be faithful to you and I want to live for you. Thank you for washing away my sins. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you, God, for loving me enough to die in my place. I want to live for you forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer, the Bible is very clear. The angels are singing your name right now. They're announcing that you're on the way. And your name is being inscribed in the registration book of heaven, heaven, the Lamb's book of life. There are new names written down in glory tonight. Praise God. Let's give God the praise for that. We're going to stand in a moment. The music is going to begin. If you want to have prayer, you actually could go to somewhere else and someone else and pray in the room if you know what they're going through and, and just offer to just be with them and encourage them and walk with them. You can go over here to the, the, the prayer rail over here and, and there'll be warriors to pray with you over there about what's on your heart because they love you. This is what they're called to do. And you could, you could tell them what you're going through. If there's someone else you need to pray for, just they'll pr help pray with you, pray with you. So in a moment, when we start the music, just do whatever God tells you to do. Be obedient. After all, that's what Dick on a record when he got in the car and prayed over a dead man. He was obedient. He didn't understand it, but he did it and, and we can see what happens. So be obedient tonight, would you? Just let God use you, speak to you, talk to you, change you. Aloha. My name is Gordon. I'm the director of the children's ministry here at One Love. I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you are inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you are new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love. You can submit prayer requests or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay united during this time of separation. So we encourage you to take that first step if you are watching today's celebration via YouTube and you want to stay informed about new content on our channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button below. But most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at office at onelove.org or call us at 808-955-9335 and let us pray with you. Our ministry leaders are ready to serve you. One last thing. If you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, check out goodnewshawaii.com. There you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo so much for tuning into One Love today. We hope you're blessed by our time together. Aloha.